Good afternoon and Merry Christmas from the Angry Astronauts. Going to be covering a topic that I haven't talked about in the last couple of months, and that is replacement for the International Space Station. Now, we know about the Star Lab project that is mostly being headed up by the Airbus Corporation, a European space station, or at least it's evolved into that, and of course, also the new space station concept from Vast, which in my opinion is the most likely company to deploy the first modules to replace the International Space Station, given how aggressively this company is moving forward and the fact that at least the first modules can be deployed by Falcon 9s. They don't require Starship or any rockets that are not currently operational in order to take flight. However, one company that seemed to be in real serious trouble. A company that, according to many reports, was running short on funds, wasn't able to pay their debts to SpaceX for flights that they had carried out recently. All of these things suggested that Axiom Space might be in serious trouble. But at the IAC convention just a couple of months ago, I got the impression that Axiom was trying to convince the public, as well as other significant personalities in the spaceflight arena, that their condition was a lot better than anybody supposed. Yes, they did have to cut back on staff. Yes, they did have to stop running their company like NASA and run it instead like a for-profit operation, but they were still afloat and still capable of moving forward, not only on the spacesuits that they are designing for the Artemis program, but also on their vision for a replacement for the International Space Station. They were one of the first to receive a multi-million dollar funding grant from NASA to build a replacement for the space station, and they had one of the best ideas, at least as far as I'm concerned. But but that idea has shifted a bit with the objective of creating a free-flying and functional space station faster than they were originally intending, which is quite interesting. And in my opinion, given Axiom's progress thus far, the tangible evidence that they have of all the work that they've done on this station up to this point and the two other companies who are aggressively competing to do the same thing, I think it's very likely that we are going to have a fully functional private commercial station in low Earth orbit by 2028, a full two years before NASA is going to need it. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to the Angry Astronaut. So here's the first question that many people might ask about a space station. I mean, apart from giving NASA something to spend its money on, why is a station in orbit so important? And why are so many countries starting to pursue this? What makes working in space and experimenting in space such an important and unique thing? And why would companies pay money for it? Well, there's a variety of different applications that you can really only do in microgravity. And one of them is something that just about everybody is familiar with. And this, of course, is the art of 3D printing. Now, of course, this is something we do here on our own planet all the time. But the reason we want to do a specific kind of 3D printing, that is to say, bio 3D printing in microgravity, is because certain types of biological 3D printing exercises, whether it be creating nanobots that are capable of attacking cells far more effectively than any sort of antibodies that the body itself might be able to create, or various types of new 3D printed medicines and 3D printed organs so that organ procurement becomes a thing of the past, all of these things are much easier to do in microgravity. 
Why? Well, because the effects of our gravity here on Earth cause any sort of 3D printed biological substance to just collapse into a puddle at the bottom of a petri dish, whereas if you print it in space, it stays where it is and it's a lot easier to work with and modify. So this is just one of a variety of different materials that can be worked on exclusively in space. It also includes different types of 3D printed metals, new types of medicines that can be manufactured, modified, and chemically engineered far more effectively in microgravity than it can be here on Earth. These are materials that are worth millions of dollars per kilogram. I mean, think about it. If you could transplant a heart into a patient utilizing their own DNA as opposed to a questionable viability organ from a donor, you would have far greater success and far less waste in the whole transplant arena, completely revolutionizing that field of medicine. And that's just one type of science that can be done on a space station that could make an enormous amount of money for the owners, which is one of the reasons why NASA incented a number of different companies with sizable grants to begin working on their own space stations. And as I said before, Axiom Space was one of the first to get moving on this. And as you can see, they've made tangible progress. As a matter of fact, their habitation module has passed its critical design review. So it is getting very close to being ready to be deployed. However, Axiom's philosophy on building this station has changed. Originally, what they wanted to do was attach the habitation modules to the International Space Station station first. These new habitat modules would be connected to the ISS's life support and power systems in order to provide functionality to them before the space station became free-flying and independent, meaning that they could take astronauts, space tourists, whatever, before the power tower got installed at the end of the process and the whole thing became a free-flying station. However, now Axiom has determined that there's going to be a problem with that based on NASA's new plans. In early 2020, NASA agreed to give Axiom access to a port called Node 2 to start installing their habitat modules. However, that port is going to be used by the US deorbit vehicle that is going to deorbit the space station in 2030 that is currently being built by SpaceX. This, of course, is a conflict and the threat was that Axiom space station might not be ready to be free flying by the time this deorbit vehicle needed the port. Also, in my opinion, Axiom felt that they probably wouldn't be ready to free fly their space station before the ISS was deorbited in 2030. So the new objective was to create a free flying space station that had its own power source as early as possible. So the Axiom PPTM module that will provide the power and life support for the station will be the first module to be attached to the ISS and then the Hab 1 module will be deployed and then the two modules will dock together independent of the ISS and form a free flying station right off the bat capable of handling up to four crew members. The Axiom Hab 1 station is the nucleus of future human activity in Earth's orbit. Each personal crew quarter is equipped with a large Earth viewing window and touchscreen comms panel, a docking adapter allows visiting vehicles to dock to the Axiom station. Four radial ports on the hub provide for the addition of future modules and increase the station's docking capability. Then the third module that gets added is the airlock module, followed by a second habitat module. And then the fourth and last module to be added to the station is the RMF or Research and Manufacturing module with Earth Observatory, something that 
what I previously called the Zero Gravity Hot Tub, an absolutely enormous observatory giving a spectacular view from low Earth orbit. And incidentally, the modules are currently being modified to accommodate a power and life support design. So they don't have to start over from scratch. They can use what they've already built in order to create this power and life support module, which as you can see, is well on its way to completion. And the plan is to have a fully functional free flying station by 2028, actually two years earlier than Axiom had originally intended. So that is very impressive to think that we're going to have a functional space station capable of handling four at least and possibly eight astronauts in three years. And since power and life support is the first thing to be deployed, it means that the station can function with essentially two modules deployed by two launches as opposed to the four that were originally intended, making the task a lot more accomplishable by this 2028 date. In addition to that, there's going to be a fair amount of ISS equipment being transferred over to the new station, which is something I'm very, very happy about. Anything that can be cannibalized from the ISS before it gets deorbited, anything that's useful to Axiom anyway, will be transferred over because these modules are attached directly to the ISS, Axiom being the only company that has the intention to attach its modules directly to the old space station before it gets deployed. As I say, not only does this work in terms of cost savings, equipment savings, not as much mass having to be deployed to orbit, etc., we're also saving pieces of history. I'd really like to be able to save the ISS as a monument in some sort of graveyard orbit, but if it turns out that that can't be done, at least parts of the station will survive in the new Axiom station. And in addition to that, it's important to note that Axiom is doing most of this job in-house, much as SpaceX does it. Yes, Talos Elenia is building a lot of the pressure vessels, but the rest of the work is being done in Houston, and as you can see, Axiom has its own maneuvering thrusters for the station as well, which is going to become increasingly important as space junk becomes a greater and greater threat in low Earth orbit until we find a better solution for this ever-increasing problem. So, in conclusion, I gotta say that Axiom, in spite of the financial challenges they've had lately, has a very good plan for moving forward. Based on everything I've seen and the people I've talked to at this company, I I detect lots of confidence. I detect lots of people who feel very enthusiastic about the work they're doing and feel extremely determined to get this job done because it is so important that mankind maintains a constant present in low Earth orbit and that this just doesn't become a temporary thing that dies with the ISS. That would simply be unacceptable. Of course, China would continue to have their space station, and who knows, the Russians might be able to deploy one sometime in the future, but the West absolutely needs at least one space station, and preferably more. And although I remain very impressed with the work being done by companies like Sierra Space and also Vast, I have a special place in my heart for this company that granted me an interview years ago when my channel was a tenth of its current size, who gave me their value valuable time to explain their long-term objectives and the benefits of a space station to mankind. And so I'm pulling for Axiom Space. Thank you very much for watching and a special thanks to Andrew Lockwood, Lagrange Point One, FM, Christopher Deeb, Jeb Sprague, Gary Rear, Jerome Owens, and finally, Quentin Nichols, all new Patreon members. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me, and a lot of them have joined, I think, because of the recent work being created by Digital Voodoo, uh, the Amua Mua video we have coming out in the next few days. Stay tuned, because I am super impressed with the work that Digital Voodoo does, and of course, I'll be adding my narration to that, explaining why I believe 
believe a muamua to be an artifact of alien technology rather than some sort of asteroid that was capable of doing things that asteroids simply can't do. So until next time, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>